Hey, Anita, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, Brian, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I am a sales performance consultant and coach. I live just outside of Chicago. I've been in B2B sales support and direct sales, gosh, for over 20 years. Please don't do the math in your head. Um, and I am a huge sales advocate for sales professionals. I love to help sales professionals and sales leaders succeed. Um, and I'm a mom surviving two teenagers. Wow, that's a lot, huh? <laughs> Now you went and wrote a book. Why'd you decide to do that? That's a lot of work for a salesperson. Boy, is it a lot of work. Um, and so, I mean, I do a lot of coaching and I moved from direct sales into sales coaching and um, performance consulting because it just turned out that I felt a lot happier doing that, yeah. helping others succeed. And there was more of a fulfillment um, when I knew I could make my targets, but when I was able to help somebody else make theirs, that's where that's where it was met, meaningful to me. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, I love what I do. It's pretty much what I can say. Cool. And is that so, uh, psychology degree paying off? Is that really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I used to joke all the time that I want to um, refund. Like, who do I call for a refund for my psychology <laughs> degree? It doesn't work though. <laughs> it doesn't work out. And now I'm like, geez, I'm glad it didn't work out because that stuff is really helping me out. Um, so yeah, in the book, I mean, I wrote the book basically because reps kept on coming to me and saying, dude, you need to write a book, right? Like that became the conversation. And, um, you know, it was something that they saw in me and they helped me actually realize that that's something I needed to do. And I, I think you touch on a, a great topic because there's a lot of people in sales trying to automate it. And the more we automate it, the harder it's getting for most of us. Yes and confusing and complex and all those things. Yeah. Technology is great when it works and when it's serving the purpose of helping whoever that human being is become successful or achieve their objectives. And I believe that there's definitely a place for automation, AI, machine learning in sales, hundred percent, but the robots aren't going to take the job of B2B sales professionals who are out there, you know, doing work and hard to know their customers and make their customers be successful. And so I think there's somewhere there's a balance there um, between using the technologies to help make you more efficient, but knowing that you're going to be most effective when you're leveraging what's really human about you. Well, that's it. Because the problem wasn't, how can I send more emails faster? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Is, how can I get to talk to more people? Exactly. And, and even, and what am I going to say to actually get their attention? Right. And, and that's, and that's on me. I mean, there's no automated program that's going to say something is going to tell me what I can say to matter to my customer. And so as long as the human being is buying, I think we're good as long as we make sure we're very human in our sales process. And that's it. And the technology could have been used to find out what they care about yes. instead of us coming up with a five or 50 step cadence to torture that's right. them. To that's either right. Put your hands up or I'm going to keep going. <laughs> well, yeah, interrogation, right? Like that's one of the things that drives me bananas. I'll be in, I'm an embedded coach. So I go out on calls with, with some of my clients and, and they just, they have their little discovery list and they'll start asking them. And I'm just like, I want to facepalm for that customer myself because they feel like they're in the hot seat. So um, it's about really learning and listening and being curious and genuine and asking those questions. The minute they think you're going through a script, you're done. <laughs> You're just That's a sales it. dude. You know, we get put in what I call the rep zone. It's yes. like, you know, when relationships, you have the friend zone. Yes. Where, you know, once you're in there, you ain't getting out. You're not getting out. Exactly. Right. Right. Don't know why. It's just part of us mammals. That's I love way. that. Yeah, that's so true. But in sales, if we act transactional, I'm the sales rep, you're the client. Let's do, the, do our dance. That's right. And the number two problem I hear from reps is the radio silence. Yes. That, okay, I got in, they're interested, they need it, want it, and can afford it, but they're not communicating. Yeah. yeah. And the reason is they don't need you from a transactional standpoint. Exactly. And someone outdid you, right? Someone outsold you. I mean, that's might be exactly what's happening. And they don't want to tell you. They don't have a question. Right. They yeah, don't have exactly. a need to give a proposal and they think That's of right. you as a rep. That's right. Instead of that, when you had that opportunity to be able to talk to them, not just about the product, the problem, yeah. the gap between where they are and where they want to be, but you could talk about the industry, their career, the career, what other people are doing, all the other things that come into play yes. that aren't transactional. 
Yeah. And, and create the safety, right? So one of my, one of the things I try to teach reps is go in there and figure out what is motivating that, that um, customer, because sometimes their career, these decisions, their career could be on the line, like their personal image that, that their company has of them. Treat it with care, right? So make sure that you are creating an environment of safety so that they know you are not going to let them look a fool. Yeah. And once they feel that, it's going to be a lot easier to for them to commit to you and make and keep small commitments like following up on emails and actually answering your calls. One of the things I say um, in the book, like I've got a list of questions you can ask yourself is, uh, you know, are they answering my calls? Like if they are, then you're getting there. You're going to be a trusted guide and advisor and advocate for them. If they're not answering your calls, you got to ask yourself, okay, what can I do better to really matter to them? Right. And one of those things is, you know, kind of be able to talk to them about what they care about mm -hmm. beyond just the product. And, and people are like, well, how about if they can talk to my manager? Well, they don't, why would they want to talk to your manager? We got to understand that there, this is a long multi-step process yes. and how are we going to prevent it from getting stuck? Yeah, exactly. Human beings don't make decisions on eeny, meeny, miny, mo. right? There's a million different factors that come into play. And mm. I'm here to say a lot of those are emotional. Um, and, you know, so you can get past your features and benefits and your product and your company value. And yay, good, that's table stakes now. But where you've got to differentiate is, you know, who are you? What do you stand for? And why does that matter to that customer? Yeah. And how do you build that trust so that they will answer your questions? Exactly. Yeah. You know. um, so how do you coach people through this? Um, yeah, I'm sure you, the book probably helped you clarify it and just get it out of just a list of great ideas into a bunch of pages of great ideas. Yeah, it's fun because a lot of the, th one of the things that was important to me in, in writing the book, which of course beat the bots, um, is that it's a lot of stories. I, I've learned a little couple of things about sales reps, having been one and having worked with so many. They don't have time to read a lot of data or interest, right? Like they're not trying to read a new multi-step methodology that they're supposed to learn. That is not, it's just not going to happen. So it's stories. I've got, I call them trench tales and it's stories either from when I was direct selling or when I was as an embedded coach, which of course that's the person that goes out into sales calls with you to just kind of see how you're doing. And so that's the start for me. Just like I tell them to go do discovery. My discovery is learning exactly how they're approaching their customer in that environment. And then I come back and say, okay, listen, you know, you acted like you were really stuffy in that conversation. What is going to make the customer pull their defenses down if your defenses are up so high? Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's those things. It's starting um, with learning who they are, what, what they're doing and, and how they're approaching it. And same, same you got to do with your customers. Who are they? What are they trying to do? And how are they approaching it? And you got to jive with that. Yeah. We kind of roll with it. That's it. Yeah. And what are people getting out of the book? Anything that you're surprised about or... Yeah, it's funny. So, you know, you write a book and you're like, yeah, I hope some people read it. But I have been, I have been utterly overwhelmed by the response to this book. I mean, and truly just humbly, I, I had no idea how many people were going to read this. And I, I've been getting emails and texts like, hey, I use this and I use that. And the book has only been out for a couple of weeks. And yeah. these people are doing it. And one um, email that I got was so meaningful to me. It was about how I teach in the book, I talk about you know, if you can do nothing else, if you're, if you think I'm full of crap for all the things I've written here, please just take this one. Before you go into your customer, five minutes in the car, ask yourself, what do I have to do to strike a chord with them on an emotional level? What do I need to do to give to them um, from a rational level to earn the right to ask the emotional questions? And so one gentleman sent me an email and he said that he took that and put it on a post-it note and put it right in his car. Yeah. And that he looked at that every day before, every time he went to a customer meeting. And so at that point, it's like, you know what? It worked. What you wanted to have happen with this book, it has worked. And um, I just wanted to help. And, and people are using his stuff. So yeah, it's extraordinary. And that's it. And I think today salespeople need micro learning. Mm -hmm. the, the days of the two-day workshop, and they're going to you know, accept somebody else's view of how to sell. Yeah. Or change their personality. That's it. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. I think well, they'll chew you up and spit you out. I mean, you can't right. do that. Yeah, and I think you know, I think that's why podcasts work is people that's can right. listen to it, get a couple of little things, and then start building out their game. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I tell them, I say, you know, first thing in the morning, um, you know, I know that a lot of you guys don't have a ton of time to read books and, um, you know, listen to books on tape, but do this, listen to a podcast, pick one podcast to listen to when you're getting ready in the morning, brushing your teeth and have that be the mindset that you go into the day with. Right. And I think that's so important. It's something I've been doing for years, whether it's podcasts or just, um, listening to a book on tape, it, it you know, it is micro learning. It's learning when you have an opportunity and not so heavy, not like taking me out of the field for yeah. days on end. And I'm going to forget everything after I leave this class. So it's just, it's, it's a much different way of learning. Yeah. And I think, especially when you do interviews, because I, I used to love audible books and I still listen to them quite yeah. a bit, but I've kind of switched to podcasts. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll even take the author and I'll search a That's bunch of exactly interviews. Exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> Because the Audible book is really polished. Yeah. And I just want the real person. I want to hear what their story is. A little interaction, a little Mm -hmm. Mm Q&A, you know, where the the person's kind of caught a little off balance and has to think on their feet and it's a little bit more organic is really good. Now, when you're coaching reps, what do you typically see? What's the kind of like the number one consistent thing? So um, in terms of what is troubling to me, (laughs) consistent thing is that people will go in, like we talked about before, with that discovery script, or they go in with a great intention of being curious and learning about the customer. But the minute they get an answer that they don't know exactly what to do with, they get nervous. And then they go back to their silly little script of questions and then back to interrogation mode. And I think one of the things that's hard for me to make sure I get through to them is it's okay. If you get an answer that you're kind of like, I don't really know where to go with that. That's okay. Move on to the next thing. Don't let it, don't let it shake you to the point where now you feel like you have to start reading bullets on a slide. Don't just don't do it. And are they able to build that rapport with people kind of genuinely, or is that something they, they have trouble with? I think a lot of people do have trouble with it. And and the guys that I think are going to beat the bots, right? The guys and gals are the ones that go in there and don't go in there as super stuffy professionals or like that slimy, sneaky, shady sales guy that people think of in their mind when they think of salespeople. It's on us to change that reputation. And the way we do it is by going in there, being real, um, showing them that our purpose is to help that customer make the right choice and give them glory. And in order to do that, I got to know what glory means to them. And so that's what we have to get the reps. That's the mindset reps have to go into the call with. And I found when they do, the questions do flow a lot easier and it's more natural. It's not a script. It's let me learn about you. And so that's kind of a curiosity uh, mindset. And what, what I've learned is a lot this year about is this outward mindset, being able to empathize with somebody else, put yourself in their place. What's their day look like? How do they get rewarded? How do they get punished? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. How do they make money? What's their bonus? What's their bonus going to be on? Right. Right. That's important for me to know so that I can help them get there. And what happens is when you go in with that mindset and that empathy, people catch on. Like they can sense when someone is being um, sincere and genuine and wants to serve them. Once that happens, there's some kind of magic switch that goes off and they now trust you. And now you're not going to have a problem getting them to take you to their boss or their peers because they know that your only goal is to make them look good. And so that's, that's the, that's where the curiosity ultimately gets you is showing them how much you care. Yeah. And I've always had this analogy of kind of a Sherpa or, you know, a bellboy is really not the right because it has a low status where you're carrying the bags. Yeah. But if, you, if you've ever gone into like a super nice hotel, mm-hmm. well, as soon as you arrive, somebody takes your stuff, they walk you to the front desk, they take your keys, they show you how to get to the room. They set the room up the way you want. Yes. They ask, what kind of food do you like? Are you into the gym, the pool, the sauna, the spa? What's your bag? Yeah. And I think that's what we're doing with deals. That's Instead right. of this uh, pers- super persuasion and lock them down and tighten them up, handle every objection. Yeah, it's it's personalized. We're personalizing it. Just, I love that example. So hotel is a perfect example of how hard companies work to personalize experiences for their customer. And guess what? B2C expectations are coloring 
B2B expectations. People yeah. that are able to go out there and um, you know, have a customized experience with a, even a movie theater, they want more out of their interactions and sales, whether it's B2B or B2C. And so it's on us to figure out what are the ways that I can personalize this experience. One is just by being you and being that guide. Um, and then two, what, what's going to make it easier for them? How do I get this process to work with what their needs are? I mean, you keep on hearing me say this. It's them. It's about them. It's there. It's the customer. Um, you know, and, and the sales professionals that get that are the ones that are ultimately going to be um, immune to anything that AI could throw their way. And, and that's it because AI, I think we've just used it backwards. Yes. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, the scraping to get mm-hmm. the data, put it into a list, spam people mm-hmm. with our messaging about what we care about, not yes. engaging anybody, not talking about what they care about. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah, because I'm sure anyone did any research before they go in the meeting. You can find out what school they went to. Uh, their family situation, where they mm-hmm. live, mm-hmm. probably their sports, if they're into it, what books they've read, right? Uh, you know, just their, their wallpaper that they use on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's right. A That's sense right. of who they are. Yeah. And, and that'll feed your curiosity. Feeds your curiosity. And it doesn't have to be the fish on the wall thing, but it <laughs> can right. be something that, to get into their head That's and, it. and, and then, break through that ice. You're 100% right. And I talk about it a lot, but get into their head, get into their mindset of where, where are they and meet them where they're at. And it's funny, like you have to be able to ask the right questions and do it without being creepy. This is where it gets tricky sometimes, right? So yeah. if you've got a rep who's going to go in and immediately go for, so what's your bonus structure? That is creepy. <laughs> Yeah. And they're going to get kicked out on their ear, right? Like yeah, that's not going to judge. Facebook. Yeah, they're oh, cute. exactly. <laughs> or, um, yeah, well, there's a great story in the book about that, about how um, a rep was found out from another friend that there was uh, the client or prospect that he was after coached uh, a team, uh, like a soccer team. And so he decides to enroll his daughter into that soccer team. And so now he's there trying to talk to that coach every day. And the coach is like, do you not? I mean, I know what you're trying to do and no, it's not okay. And so, you know, it's one of those things where use your common sense, don't be creepy. Right. And some people it's a blurry line, but I try to get that clear to them. Yeah. And I think that it keeps coming back to that inward mindset versus outward mindset. And and if you can't make that switch, and I think people got to start looking for this in the interview process. That's right. You know, the people who are asking about vacation time Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And your dog policy and what <laughs> what kind of cake do I get on my birthday? That's it. Exactly. That's all about them. That's right. And, and anywhere, I mean, we go to if we go out and just try to buy something, you don't go into Best Buy and try to buy something and have that person talk all about them and what matters to them. And here's all these products. And I mean, it's mind boggling. And then you try to you run away. I mean, you leave and you go buy it from Amazon. Like, I mean, that's what happens. So we have to avoid that in our world. We have to make sure that we're interesting, that we're curious, that we're caring and authentic, and we engage that customer. And how do you keep the ball rolling so that you, you say you have that great meeting and, and I, I, I have this analogy, the, the pile of great ideas. <laughs> that's right? right. It's not that your product's bad or they're buying your competitor, nope. uh, but they have 50 other things they could do with their time and money. That's right. And yours is on the list, but it's not top. That's right. You get it top by you get it to the top by making it about what you create value wise for them. Yeah. So you got to learn what value means to them, and then you have to be able to convince them in a short time, sometimes a meeting, that you are trustworthy and that you will deliver on what value means to them. You know, I I work a lot with technology sales professionals, and one of the things that's so pitiful to me is they'll go in and they'll start talking about digital transformation, for example. It's like all the buzzword everywhere. And I, I mean, it's almost like a drinking game at this point, right? So they go out there and they just ask about digital transformation and the customer, that phrase means something so different to, to everybody. every single person. Yeah. So you just to go out there and try to you know, talk about, hey, we're here to help you with digital transformation. No, you're not, because you don't know what that means to me. It's presumptuous and um, you won't get that trust when you do something like that. Yeah, so I think, I, I try and teach, you know, break the process into more smaller pieces mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because there's going to be time gaps on their side. Yeah, that's right. They have to build consensus. They have to 
justify it. They have to keep the ball moving. And if you go in, uh, present, demo, propose, you know, you, you've already put the prenup on the table. That's exactly right. And they're going to the run. Engagement ring, right? <laughs> and they're going to run. They're going to be like, that engagement ring's not big enough. Bye bye. Right? Yeah, prenup's <laughs> too tight. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So, you want to give them enough so that they know the value, but don't, I mean, you don't want to bury them in the details early on. What you're saying, break it into smaller pieces, pace yourself, do it in a logical sequence. Like, again, going back to being creepy, don't try to have, you know, um, customer intimate type conversations when you've only just met them. Yeah. Make it step by step and that's hard, right? And one of those things that we're taught early on is you have to slow down to speed up, but it's hard. When you're a sales rep and you're out there and you're a go-getter and you wanna see that commission check, it is darn hard to slow down. And that's a huge thing that I have to train within my classes and when I do coaching. Yeah, and how do you do that though? Do you just explain what they have to do on their side? And yeah. That's it. So I explain what they need to do. I give them examples, um, you know, and then sometimes I get to do the inopportunity coaching, right? So I'll go out on the first couple calls and then I'll say, okay, what do you think would be a good thing to do? You're not meeting with them again until two weeks. How, how are you going to approach this? The, the, the wrong answer is send a quote or a proposal. This is the wrong answer, right? But I'm, I'm appalled at how many times that comes across and these blind, um, that's it. Well, and they're, oh my gosh, the blind quotes. Like, let me just send over a quote in a- Unsolicited a, proposal. On, I mean, nobody, who wants that? Nobody wants that. So, right, exactly. And so it's like, you know what, just take a moment, think about what would be a thoughtful thing to do? What can you do to make sure that they remember you in this conversation, right? What's something that you learned that you can go back and say, hey, guess what? I was reading um, online and I found this article and it totally reminded me of our conversation. Keep in their, keep in their line of sight, but don't be yeah. obnoxious about it. And so find the things that make you thought, show them that you're thoughtful is well, what I would say. Well, that's it because you brought up digital transformation. It means yes. a bunch of things. Oh God. But, but you know, the, the end goal is beautiful. It's nice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, <clears throat> and they probably care about some part of it and it affects yeah, them right. from their career, their day to life, day to day life, being able to continue that conversation. Yes. Yep. You know, ask them. It's not about your product. It's about their job and what they're doing and in about their career. That's right. Ask you them. Know. Ask them. What does digital transformation mean to you? It's yeah. so simple to me. Just ask them. And then just watch the floodgates open. You will learn so much more than you ever could imagine by just asking them to go into their definition and their mindset. And in there, you're going to find nuggets that are then going to help you tailor your messaging and share your product value with them in a manner that matters to what they've just illustrated for you. And, and a lot of people view that as a waste of time, but it, right. it's like, no, I don't think people understand what, what's going on on the other right. side there. That's right. Yeah, what are you expecting to get out of digital transformation? How can I expect to present to someone about digital transformation or cloud or any other technology or any other solution if I don't know what they're trying to get out of it? Yeah. mind boggling, right? So going in with a slide deck about this is what we do. This is how we help you transform. That's not okay because you don't know what transform means. For some people, digital transformation means, you know, just coming into the century and having um, IP phones or something of that nature, just changing basics and other companies, it means completely doing an overhaul of how they run business. So you got to know, you got to know. And, and I like the two things that you said, but you know, the preparing before the call, because uh, I used to ask myself, and when I became a, a manager, I would ask the rep, how do you think it's going to go? And when I heard, let's see how it goes. Oh, God. Oh, God that's not what I asked. Wrong answer. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> would you walk into a bar? <laughs> see how it goes. You think yeah, exactly. It goes into a house. Let, let's see how it goes. Let's see how let's see it goes. If armed or not. There's uh, no such thing as let's see how it goes because then how it's going to go is bad. Yeah. And, and what ends up happening is, okay, do they know who we are? Are they looking at anybody else? Is it warm? Is it cold? What, have, what do they know so far? How long has the people been here? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think their priorities are? I mean, and you can kind of pre-game yes. the sales call. Yeah. And then yeah. if you write that down and then after the call, you go, how well did we predict yes. that, that call? And yes. how could we have done it better? You know, did we check out their website, their LinkedIn profile? Mm -hmm. Do we Google their news? See what they're talking about? 
you know, mm-hmm. did there new any new players in there? That's it. And, and, and going in there and just asking the right questions about that without, like, again, without being creepy. But here's the other flip side of that that I find interesting is sometimes, you know, you, we focus so hard on doing the research on the customer that when we go in there, we forgot that the customer is researching us. Yeah. So we better know what our online profile, whether that's me as a rep or what the company, I mean, Glass, I got to know what Glassdoor is saying about my company because I promise you my customer does. Right. If they're ser- if they're taking me serious, they're looking at things like that out there online. It um, comes up like one or two. That's right. You see exactly. a two star glass door and you're like, you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. And you and they're going to ask you, I mean, if they are serious and they should. Right. If, if yeah. they're serious and if this is truly something that's going to be a you know, fruitful relationship, they need to know why is that a two. And so just make sure that you go in not only knowing about the customer, but be very self-aware in terms of what your reputation is online and what the company's reputation is online. Because the last thing you want is to go in and talk about something and have the customer say, well, wait, that's not, the, that's not what I saw on your website. Your company website says X, Y, and Z. I've had that happen. In, yeah. a, in a sales call with a rep once and I wanted to crawl under the table. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh man, you got to know what your story is. You have to know it cold. Uh, yeah. And that postmortem, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had a manager who was adamant about it early in my career. Mm-hmm. I learned so much and it wasn't just a five minute in the car. It was yes. back at the office, whiteboarding out the org. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. afterward I go, I didn't pick up any of that stuff. Yep. You know, they were bringing up like, why'd they ask this? And that's a red flag. And that's it. I don't think they've won this project yet. And Yeah, that's it. And it's, it's about like just going back and, and evaluating yourself. And that's, that's something that really is important, I think, in learning. And especially in when we're trying to differentiate, it has to be a constant um, expectation of, of improving yourself, your, your yeah. craft, um, improving your approach, all of those things you have to work on it. And I love, I love it when sales leaders do postmortems. I think that's brilliant. And at that point, you know that they're not just worried about the number, they're worried about growing that sales professional. And those are the kind of sales leaders that I just, I love working with. Yeah. And it's not about what you did wrong. It's what happened. Yes. Uh, did, did you think we missed something? How do we, what, is the next step? Uh, how do you think this is going to play out? Yes. You know, yep. it, it, like it, I always look at like the pipeline day one of a quarter and then the <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the phenomena. <laughs> right. And then you're like, well, what, is, what if our judgment was better? Because I think, you know, judgment is a superpower of a salesperson. That's exactly right. That's you know, right. what to work on and what order. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talk, prioritization. talk about the application of AI. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. And so some people are using AI to like record. There's, um, I forgot the name of the company, but I was at a conference recently and they talked about this um, tool that it listened to sales conversations, the recordings. And it talked about the tone, the inflection. It analyzed um, where, who was asking more questions, the rep or the customer. And now that's a way to use AI and tools to really help you up your game. I'm all in for that. Those bots can stay. Yeah. Right. But it's, it's, you know, we just need to make sure that it's there to serve the sales rep in a way that's going to help them improve their craft. Yeah. Cool. So if somebody invested in the book and read it, uh, what would they get out of it? Um, they would get some insight on how to use who they are and what they stand for and make that the differentiator. They'll learn a thought process. I don't believe in checklists and, you know, long methodologies. It's just, this is the kind of stuff you guys have to start thinking if you're going to be able to succeed in the long run and the, and and it's all encapsulated in there cool and what formats is it, is it in kindle uh, paperback yeah kindle paperback hardcover and audiobook to be coming later this year awesome cool yeah and on amazon i assume yes yep. cool